Welcome back to The Money Show here on Arise News. Saudi Aramco has confirmed its plans to list on the Riyadh Stock Exchange in what could be the world's biggest initial public offering. The state-owned oil giant will determine the IPO launch price after registering interest from investors. Business sources say the Saudis are expected to make shares available for 1% or 2% of the firm, and the offer will be for existing company shares. Saudi Aramco is thought to be worth about $1.2 trillion, or, well, in you know, some other estate estimates, about $2 trillion. Meanwhile, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation has said that it is in the process of establishing two new 200,000 barrels per day condensate refineries to boost in-country refining capacity. The Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Timmy Preciva, noted that the refinery would attract more foreign direct investment into Nigeria upon completion. Please recall that President Buhari requested Aramco to visit Nigeria to carry out a diagnostic assessment of the NMPC refineries, pipelines, and other infrastructure. He wanted Aramco to deploy its technical expertise to improve the efficiency of the oil and gas industry in Nigeria. Welcome to the program, uh, Balazaka. You are the expert on this subject, and we're glad uh, to have you here. Thank you. Now, Aramco is said to be, you know, the most profitable company in the world, perhaps. You know, at the first quarter of uh, 2019, it recorded uh, over 59 billion dollars, you know, as a profit. Net uh, profit. In net profit, Fantastic. you know, more Correct. than uh, what uh, Exxon Mobil was able to record. Right. And more than, uh, you know, what some of the tech giants, uh, particularly Apple, you know, was able to... Uh, combined. Apple, Alphabet, Apple mm -hmm. and Google, um, Google's parent company, mm -hmm. Microsoft combined. Correct. So do now, not match their profits. You know, uh, now Aramco is going uh, public, Correct. IPO. What is the significance of this, one? And then what are the risks involved? Do you think international investors or other investors will be interested in this IPO, considering the fact that only about a month ago or so, um, there was drone attack on Correct. two fields, and then there are many other issues. Political issues, issues. that's why. Right. Yeah, uh, when you talk about uh, initial public offering, uh, it's something that's generally good, you know, because you want to give opportunities to, to, to outsiders, probably more people to come in and invest. But when you talk about a company like Saudi Aramco, it is probably, if not the most profitable com company in the world, is the, the number one best performing company in the world in terms of profits. And uh, you're dealing with what we talk, what we can best describe as an international commodity this, this time around, you know, that has a global value, you know, and which is oil and gas. And you're also talking about a country that belongs to a very, very strong cartel that controls probably the oil and gas industry uh, basically in the world. So going for this IPO or initial public offering is a fantastic idea. But before you go for that, you must have what we call a legacy of certain things, you know, like profitability, accountability, transparency, and, and many other things. If you have all this in place, then you are likely to, to, to trigger or to generate confidence, you're going to generate trust, and you're going to generate probably what we can best describe as a positive perception. All these today are things you can say Saudi Aramco has. But let me just put a caveat, maybe. We we're not saying there will be no political issues, you know? There may no, you, may, you may not have security issues. And let me just explain one or two of this. When you talk about political issues, of course, we know what happened to the veteran journalist, you know, Khashoggi, you know, the death of Khashoggi, you know, the resolution is still looking cloudy, all right? And uh, on the area of security, nobody expected that the facilities of Saudi Aramco in al Kek and Kuras can actually be hit. You know, so all this, you know, will come into play. But in summary, and from your, from, from your prologue, you know, like you rightly said, you know, there was 
a given range. I have not come across anybody that valued what was going to come out below $1 trillion. And I've not seen anybody that valued it above $2.5 trillion. So, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is talking about $2 trillion. Exactly. I said, the market above. players are saying it's not more than $1.5 trillion. Exactly. And that was why I said I've not seen anybody that valued it below one trillion, and I've not seen anybody that valued it above 2.5. But do you think the IPO will succeed? It, it, it depends, because when you talk about things like this, it, it, it has a lot to do with trust. It has a lot to do with confidence, and it has a lot to do with perception. You know, there are people who perceive that axis of the world as an axis that has one or two things that have to do with, with, with probably insecurity. You know, especially with the heating of some of the facilities. So can I ask you, the fact that um, those production was restored within about a month of those attacks and the fact that they're going to be back at full capacity this month, do you think that that will assuage investors' fears in that regard? And also, what are your thoughts on the strategy being employed? It's only going to be listed on their Tadawal exchange. Initially. What do you think of that initially? What do you think of that policy? Yeah, well... On, on the heating of, of, of the facility, that, that was shocking to, to, to the global oil and gas industry community. You know, nobody expected something like that to happen. But if you look at the speed with which production was restored, that thing said something about the level of technical competence. In fact, when you talk about international investment and you talk about international companies like that, there are variables that come into play. You have what we call technical variables. You have economic variables. You have commercial variables. You have operational variables and political variables. On the technical competence, I think they did well. And there is something, again, when you talk about global companies like that trying to go out, you look at what we, we can best describe as diversity also. Just like when you rank universities globally, it says something about other people that can come into your country, into that university, as students, and also probably as lecturers. So it's the same thing. When you go to Saudi Aramco, you will be shocked to even see the number of Nigerians that are working there. We're not talking about other nationals. So that level of diversity and ability to work in a multiracial multicultural, or to accommodate multiracial, multicultural, multireligious groups, say something also about a country. And then what about the Tadawal exchange being, you know, the initial offering? I think I, I appreciate the, the, the approach. It's always, it, it looks optimistic, you know, but it's always good to start gradually. And remember, we're talking about a time frame of probably 11 years from now, talking about something that probably hopes to be fully achieved around 2030. So starting with the Tadawul uh, exchange would not be a bad idea. Mm, okay. Now, we, you were speaking about the technical competence of Saudi Aramco, and they, right. they put so much into research and development, and it's the kind of research and development, if we're going to bring it back home now, that you would love to see your own NMPC being able to put into that particular sector. And now we have reports of the president also trying to see how Aramco can come in and kind of sort of diagnose and take a look at our refineries, etc. So I want to ask a um, two-ended question here. First of all, what can we expect from that sort of diagnosis from Aramco and how beneficial would it be to Nigeria? And then how much do our current NMPC really put into research and development in the oil sector? In fact, I'm, I'm happy. I almost forgot. When you ask this question, you triggered something in me. You know, you know when, when, when we had that, this concept of shale oil came up, you know, in, in the technical industry, there is something you call heavy oil, you know, low mobility ratio, you know, low this, sour and the rest. When I had people complaining that, oh, there are some countries that are going to start converting, you know, using their shale oil, shale technology, it went back to, to research and development. And I said, while some countries, I'm sorry to say, probably including Nigeria, were sleeping, you know, you have countries that had deposit of this shale oil, you know, 
going deep into research and development, and they were able to modify their refineries to receive this same shell oil or heavy crude as a refinery stock. So that tells you what research and development can do for a country. In the case of Nigeria now, you know, let's look at it side by side. You know, we're talking about Saudi Aramco or Saudi Arabia. First of all, both of them belong to the same cartel called OPEC, you know, when you talk about crude oil. And when you are talking also about natural gas or gas generally, Nigeria belongs to another cartel we call Gas Exporting Countries Forum, you know, with headquarters in Doha, Qatar. So in terms of gas, just look at Qatar and look at how Nigeria is doing. When you look well, at, let me ask you look a at question. Saudi Arabia and look at Nigeria. Let me ask you a question about the uh, motive behind this listing of um, Aramco. They've been on it since 2016. Now Correct. we have it now. Uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman says the objective is to diversify the economy, to accelerate economic growth, and to align the listing with Vision 2030. Correct. The main objective of which is to create jobs. Unemployment in Saudi Arabia is about 12.7%. He wants to reduce it to 7%. Yeah. So thereabout. isn't there a contradiction in terms of the approach? You want to diversify the economy, and now you are making you know, uh, the oil and gas sector, even, uh, you know, the driver in uh, force. So are there lessons that Nigeria can learn from this? Yeah. Because some Nigerian policymakers now will say, oh, the way to diversify the economy is to do something in the oil and gas sector. I see a contradiction here. You, you, Before our people begin to learn the wrong lessons. Yeah, you're, you're right, you know, but you see, when you're talking about the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you know, they are not practicing democracy in the first place. But you're also talking about a country that is already doing well. Because you do well, you are measured based on what we call your GDP variables. And the first one is private consumption. Private consumption is a function of disposable income. Disposable income in Saudi Arabia is fantastic. Gross investment is fantastic. You know, government investment and expenditure is also fantastic. And when you look at the other one that is always negative in Nigeria, it's like the differential between export and import. In Saudi Arabia, is positive. So really, if you ask me what he wants to achieve, you know, there is nothing wrong in, in well, doing positive things I, even I, when you're doing well. Point, let's take a short break. Yes. When we return, then you will continue with uh, this, uh, you know, contribution. We'll take a short break now. We'll be right back. It's still the morning show. You're still watching the morning show here on the Arise News channel. Still with us in the studio is Bala Zaka. Uh, a petroleum engineer uh, who has been commenting on the Saudi Aramco listing. And before we went on break, we were just trying to see, you know, what Nigeria and uh, the NMPC can take from uh, from this. So, and you were commenting yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, you know, we're talking about the different cartels, you know. Yes. When you talk about fossil fuel, you know, whether petrol, crude oil, or, but now putting it side by side, I've always advocated that there should be what we call sharing and cross-fertilization of knowledge, especially if you, become, if you belong to the same cartel. So if Nigeria and Saudi Arabia belong to crude oil cartel, somehow, somewhere, we should see some performances, you know, or resemblance. But if you put them on the table, the variance is just more than 180 degrees. Let's start with profitability. You've seen the profitability of Saudi Arabia in terms of net profit. Last year alone, in 2018, they made a net profit of about $111 billion. Dollars. This year, in Nigeria, Nigerian refineries reported a loss of about 13.8 billion naira. Pro Refining and utilization was zero in July, quote me. The reason why we, are, we say this is because informations like this are in the public domain. We, we, we need to tell ourselves the fact. I wouldn't want to leave this studio and somebody would Google call in or tweet and say, your analyst was not educating the global audience. 
So this, when you look at it from that as angle, from the aspect of profitability, Nigeria is no match. Then come and look at laws, reforms, then take the petroleum industry bill, for instance. It's been lying down fallow for ages. At a point we decided to break it, I wouldn't want to say we balkanize it into four parts. But till this moment, even the petroleum industry governance bill has not been assented to. We still have three other bills lying. That's all right. Could you believe that till this moment I'm speaking to you, one of the bills has to do with petroleum host community. They are an understanding on the simple definition of what constitutes a host community. And we just, you know, we, 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 you need to tell yourselves your problems, admit them, then start looking for solutions. No, In the meantime, all of this money has been left on the table, but we yes. have had something move at warp speed lately, the deep offshore and inland um, basin production PSC um, amendments that was done, what, tw 26 days? On today's front cover of this day, it yes. says, concerns mount over integrities of IOCs. So we're talking about the Saudi Aramco possibly being a model for Nigeria in the future. What about what was raised in this article in this day about Iran, the Iranian model, how they actually don't use IOCs and Nigeria ought to dispense with IOCs. This is one of the opinions of the oh, analyst. Gosh. Let me finish. Yes. The, I, the analyst says Iran has developed their technical capacity to the extent that they're producing 3 million barrels barrels per day without IOCs. Do you see that as a possibility for Nigeria at any point? You, you, you know, when we were talking, we were talking about research and development, you know. But in the case of Nigeria also, if you know you need help, ask for help. When we went into the production sharing agreement, right, in 1993, the intention was that we wanted to explore the potentials we have in what we call deep waters. And when you have these deep waters, you graduate them. You know, below a given depth, what will be the risk involved? After a given depth, what will be the risk involved? So the basic things a lot of people are talking about now was just that. If the price of crude oil exceeds 25, I mean 20 dollars, you know, per barrel, the, the, the oil companies, not only IOCs actually, we're talking about just deep water technology, meaning that you can have local companies that will also be interested. Above that, should they pay a given royalty and the rest? That one, we agreed you need to review that. But nobody also tries to ask that question that in a kind of agreement you call production sharing contract, after spending billions of dollars and you get down thousands of meters and you are not able to make a single find what happens to your investment. As at the time Nigeria went into that, Nigeria needed support. There was no deep water technology information. Until today, Nigeria has reasonably gone to probably the second quadrant, but we are not yet there. So if people come up and are saying some of these IOCs were, were, were cheating, it, it, it's not really fair. Personally, I am not on the side of those that felt, you know, that those companies cheated, but I am also for review because... That's what the law says. Exactly. Deep water technology has improved. The risk has relatively reduced. You know, so you can review also the fiscal terms. There's nothing wrong about that. Well, are there to the point that Tunu raised, whether we can dispense with the IOCs. I think the major challenge is that we don't have the capacity. Simple. And, you know, originally when we entered into those production sharing agreements, yes. we did so because we didn't have the capacity. Till we, now. We couldn't even afford the cost. Till now. But let me ask you, when uh, President Buhari went to Saudi Arabia recently yes. for this future investment uh, forum, that the Saudis uh, organized. Yes. Uh, part of his uh, shopping list was to see how Aramco can support Nigeria in, you know, rebuilding our refineries, and looking at our oil and gas uh, process. Do you think that will help? Or you think we're so far behind, to as be, you to, pointed to, out, to, to be honest, that Aramco may not be interested in Nigeria? No, to, to, be, to be honest, when, when you talk about, and, and, and I don't intend to demean anybody, but I'm talking based on practical experience as a practicing petroleum engineer and also a, a knowledgeable chartered accountant. Refining is basic chemistry. 
refining at the level we're talking about now. Refining is basic chemistry. And the basic principles has to just do with boilers. You have what we call distillation or fractionating columns. You have trays and what we call the principle of temperature differentials, meaning that at a given temperature, gas will come out. Given temperature, petrol will come out. Given temperature, diesel, bitumen, bitumen okay. and the rest will come out. Every other thing be beyond that is cosmetics. And why did I say cosmetics? Is because the way you will want the, thing, the flavors to be is just a difference. So if at this stage, haven't started, or we started talking about oil and gas industry in Nigeria, like in 1965, Meanwhile, Shell came in probably in 1948, and this year you are talking and you are saying somebody should come help you fix your refineries. I think we are not fair to ourselves. And, and knowing also that you have so many Nigerians, competent Nigerians or married, even working in Saudi Aramco, I think what I would suggest we really do is we should be honest to ourselves as Nigerians. We have what it takes to move the oil and gas industry forward. There are so many things we talk about that internally we can fix. Look at crude oil theft, for instance. There was a time in this same Nigeria, it was officially reported that we were losing crude oil to thieves at the rate of 400,000 barrels per day. A lot of people would just think it's just one or two drums. But if you convert 400,000 barrels right, to gallons, and you then convert those gallons to liters and divide them by the capacity of a tanker, which is 33,000 liters, you will discover that it was reported officially that we were losing 2,000 tankers of crude oil to thieves per day. So let Does me that come, make sense? Let me come in there with so the that's addition. Why when you said we go to a place like Saudi Arabia and we've all belonged to the same cartel, they would just be wondering. Okay, so with the addition of a 200,000 barrel per day, then condensate per, uh, refinery, what sort, of, what sort of changes do the NMPC have to make to make sure that we don't end up having refineries like our other four refineries that are just put down? Because now we can see that progress is going to be made in our oil and gas sector. A lot of changes are coming about at the moment. What do we then want to expect? To I think you're talking about maintenance issues here. It's not you telling me you have what it takes to buy a brand new car, but how well can you maintain the car? You're talking about us trying to fix four refineries. And you're also talking at the same time trying to build two more refineries within a time span of like four years. It looks like a mirage to me. Because you're talking about a country where the last time we constructed or established a refinery was in 1989. Mm. From 1989 to now, 30 years, we've not been able to construct one additional one or maintain the ones we inherited. So which is why you said we should just aim to have one fully functional refinery. In fact, there was a, a time, yeah, and I, I even advised Mele Kiari. A great, good ambition, fantastic. Maybe people are beginning to really feel bad about where we are. But if possible, if he can get even two refineries refurbished and functional, fantastic. Well, if the thank you very much. comes online, thank great you. for Nigeria. Thank you very much, Balazs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like your energy. Yeah. You could go on and on and on. I don't have any other country outside. <laughs> it's a great much. country.